Hello, I'm Patty Anderson, a botanist for the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, the Division of Plant Industry in Florida. Our mission is to protect the native and commercially produced plants of Florida and to protect the bee industry. Um, as part of that, we have inspectors who look at nurseries, but uh, since we're part of consumer services, we are often able to talk with consumers and answer questions. Now, for me, the most common question I get after what plant is this is, will this plant hurt me? So I'm gonna talk with you a little bit today so that as you're enjoying our native plants, going out into the woods or in your yard where you find native plants, you'll be careful about some of them, either that may have gotten there on their own into your yard or out in the woods, you never know what you'll find. Now, I did call this wicked plants. Uh, I don't really think the plants are wicked. They're not out to get us, but um, they can kill you. So be careful. Um, so just thinking about it as humans, we need to be careful of these plants. Uh, the plants themselves are trying to be protected from all the creatures that might want to uh, eat them. So I'm thinking that you probably heard something as a child. It might have been leaves of three, let it be, or leaflets three, let it be. If we were here together in a room and I could see you all, I'd ask you to raise your hands and say, which, which did you hear? But since I can't see you at the moment, I'm going to uh, trust you'll think about that and give me the opportunity to do a little basic botany lesson here. Um, leaves, plants have leaves with a simple blade and a stalk, we call a petiole, and they grow from a bud that's attached to the twig. Leaflets are tiny leaves. Leaflets are part of what we call a compound leaf. And there you'll see that there's the bud that from which the leaf unfolds attached to the twig. There's no bud between each of the leaflets, the tiny leaves. And that's important because it's leaflets three, let it be. So some of the toxic plants we'll talk about today have compound leaves. And you'll see there's a bud growing from the twig and several leaflets attached. Um, not every plant we'll talk about has those leaves, but uh, you can be able to recognize some of them by looking for the bud. Um, as I say, they're not really wicked. In fact, this plant looks beautiful. Look at those cute little flowers. Aren't they great? Well, Toxicodendron, the name says toxic, it's poison ivy. And there are three related plants that cause dermatitis that have, will cause you to have a lot of itching. Um, there's poison ivy, poison oak, and poison sumac. Now, clearly poison ivy is the most familiar in this group. And they're in a family called Anacardiaceae. It's the poison ivy family. Uh, if you are out in the woods or under a tree, you might see a vine climbing up with three leaflets that alternate along the leaves. Um, it won't have thorns or spines. Um, and you'll have to get to know it in your area because the leaves can look a little bit different if you go from North to South Florida, if you go from sun to shade. And you wanna be uh, mindful of this leaf arrangement. Uh, maybe you're familiar with opposite and alternate Another arrangement is whirled. If leaves are arranged in an alternate pattern, at any point along a twig, you'd see only one leaf attached. If the leaflets are, if the leaves are opposite, then at each point of attachment, two leaves are growing. And if they're whirled, then you'll see three or more at, uh, attached at one point. So this is useful if you're looking at poison ivy. Remember it's alternate leaves. So it's like climbing the stairs only one at a time on either side of the stem. Other plants might have three leaflets like young 
um, box elder, Acer nagando. Uh, you can see in this photo, they kind of look like poison ivy. It looks like three leaflets, but those are opposite each other. And there's several other plants that are common um, that have that opposite arrangement. Poison ivy alternate. Another member of this family, the cousin of poison ivy is poison oak. Toxicodendron, toxic is in its name too. Pubescence means hairy. This is a, a plant that has hairy leaves. Um, they have lobes. People think they look kind of like oak leaves. That's why it's called poison oak. It's not a vine, but a shrub, usually uh, not more than one to one and a half feet tall. It can grow up to three feet, one meter. Um, but usually it's down around your knee height. Uh, it also has alternate leaves and three leaflets. Um, and it grows more in northern counties of Florida than in the very far south. And then the least familiar, the least common, is poison sumac. It's again toxicodendron. Um, it's more like a tree, a, sh a woody shrub uh, with multiple stems. It has more than three leaflets. It can have up to 15. So uh, it looks a bit different from its cousins. Uh, but the leaves are alternating along the stem. Uh, you might note the fruit. Uh, if you see a, a shrub like this with white dangling fruit, you'll notice that it's very similar to a native plant we called winged sumac. This is not poisonous. It's not a toxico. It's a ruse. Um, it has uh, small patches of leaf tissue along the midrib or the rachis of this compound leaf. So it has leaf, leaflets attached, but also we call them wings along that middle section. Uh, and if you have fruit, they'll be red. So if someone offers you uh, sumac lemonade, be sure it's the pink kind, not the white. Yes. Before we move away from, um, uh, from poison ivy, we have a question about winter identification for poison ivy. Uh, poison ivy has, is a vine, as you know, and so you'll often see a thick vine, maybe an inch thick, with rootlets uh, attaching to the tree. Uh, it might be another vine, but it could, it could be so easily poison ivy that you don't want to be touching it. Um, so be cautious out there. Yes, Marion is indicating that she believes she got a rash from their roots at one point when there were no leaves. The plant has uh, the basic toxic chemical we'll talk about in a minute in all parts of the plant. So people can get um, poison ivy symptoms from be breathing the smoke of burning uh, poison ivy if they're especially sensitive. Thank you so much. Sure. So just to look at a couple of other members of the family, some, some of the better behaved ones um, mangoes, so beloved in Florida, and cashews, which uh, can grow in far south Florida, but we're more familiar with them coming in, in cocktail mixes, uh, mixed nuts. Uh, it's, um, many of the plants in this family have simple leaves rather than the three leaflet compound leaves, and they have prominent veins. You can see on the mango and the cashew. Uh, so as you get familiar with those species, you'll get to recognize them. Um, if you don't mind a small diversion, I just wanted to mention the cashew fruit you see there. Um, it's called the cashew apple. And the, the real fruit is the nut growing below it. Um, the cashew apple part is called an accessory fruit. It comes from the the uh, flower stalk that starts to thicken and makes this uh, nice fleshy flavored fruit, sort of like a fig. Um, any kind of fruit that doesn't come from the ovary of the plant is called an accessory fruit because it comes from some other part of the plant. And then 
the fruit has a, a small covering, a hard shell like a nut, and inside is the cashew that we eat. But some people eat the cashew apple or make a juice from it. Um, one characteristic that's um, often found in this family is that they, there's a resin, a very sticky resin that turns black. And if you grow mangoes, you might have seen that on some of the fruits. Um, another member of this family, it's scary even to me, it's called poison wood. Uh, it, has an, it can have from three to seven leaflets. Uh, it does have the sticky latex that turns black when it gets to air. And it can have black spots on the leaflets. Um, this is so toxic that people talk about walking through the forest in the rain and getting outbreaks of dermatitis from this plant, just from the water of the raindrops falling through its leaves. So be very careful if you're in far south Florida and you think you see a poison wood, don't, don't run to it, run away from it. Now, there are some plants that we might confuse with it. Now, the black spots on the leaves, we often see that similar spots on persimmon, Diospyrus virginiana, our native persimmon, will often have black spots, especially in the fall. And then the compound leaves, the shape is similar to the tourist tree, Bursera simaruba. So if you're in South Florida, you might confuse the shape of the leaves, but the trunks are very different. The poison wood has this uh, usually speckled orange black uh, trunk where the resin has started to dry. And the tourist tree has peeling red bark like tourists who've been out in the sun too long and their skin begins to peel. Here's an example of someone who got too close to a poison wood tree. Not a very comfortable experience. And these people were too close to a mango. So one brushed the tree with his, brushed a fruit with his ear as he walked under the tree and the other poor person was eating one. Now to get back to what causes this and why you might find it in many parts of the um, plant, uh, this plant is filled with a chemical called urushiol and it's related to tannins that make our tea astringent. Um, it's soluble in oil or alcohol. And if you're sensitive to it, it can cause you all kinds of pain and misery. Um, maybe a quarter of people are not sensitive to it, but you probably don't wanna be doing a lot of self-testing on this if you aren't sure. Um, it can be colorless or pale yellow uh, as we said before, it could be in any part of the plant. And um, it bonds with the oil in our skin. So it's sort of combining, getting close to those oil glands. And after the, that short time, 15 to 30 minutes, it can't be washed off. So the best plan is to prevent the, the contact um, First of all, learn to identify the plants. It's great fun to identify plants, although you might not want to be um, dissecting them. Learn to, these are some you should learn to recognize on site. If you go in the woods, or if you know you have an infestation in your own home, yard, landscape, um, wear protective clothing, long sleeves, long pants. Uh, wash your clothes and tools if you're in contact with them. And you can always ask your friends to peel mangoes for you. Um, another way to prevent uh, an outbreak is to use one of the many products that have been developed. Uh, there's a, a blocking lotion that uh, feels like clay on your skin that prevents the oil from uh, getting to you. Uh, there's soap that you can wash uh, quickly after exposure. Um, some people say that if you wash with, just with soap and water or rubbing alcohol, you can prevent a rash. Uh, you might just have to deal with symptoms. And some people say vodka 
is a, a good treatment. And I don't know if they're saying uh, you pour it onto the rash or you drink it and forget the symptoms, but um, you'll have to be the judge of that. Um, there is some treatment. Uh, first of all, if you are, know you are very allergic, um, you should be aware. And if you are accidentally in contact with anything that makes you have trouble breathing or uh, start swelling immediately, go to the doctor, call 911. Don't hesitate. Don't be afraid to be the person who goes to the emergency room. If it's less severe, you can have an oatmeal bath or a bath with baking soda that's supposed to help. And then there's the old fashioned remedy of calamine lotion. Uh, and you can have a positive attitude, but just don't scratch. Uh, some people ask if uh, poison ivy can affect pets. Usually uh, they are, cats and dogs are not affected. There's always the unusual animal that has some special sensitivity, but they can get the oils on their fur and transfer it to you. So if you see a dog running and playing in poison ivy. Um, try to get the, the dog washed at a safe distance from you before you break out in the rash. And Patty? Yes. Real quick, before uh, we move on, you have you've talked about plant families and you've talked about plant species. You wanna give, in case we don't have any, if we don't have very many plant people in the audience, or if we have a few people who aren't plant people in the audience, just go over a few examples of plant families and plant species and kind of what they are. Sure. Um, the plants we look at that we see, we, that we tell apart, uh, are like individuals. Um, they're, they can be very similar in that they are, um, have common characteristics and form a species. Like all humans are in the same species. Even though we look very different, we are all individual in our characteristics. Um, plants are grouped together in a way to help us organize them. They have two names, a genus and species. So a genus is like uh, our last name. So my name is Patty Anderson. I'm individually Patty, which would be analogous to a species. And Anderson is analogous to a genus. We're all related. Um, the family is a larger group, a larger category of similarly related uh, plant species. So these are organizing principles that people have come up with. The father of the system we use is uh, Carl Linnaeus and uh, Sometimes the system is called uh, binomial nomenclature, two names, or the Linnaean system. The idea is that we can have an organized way of thinking about groups of plants by seeing similar characteristics. So if you see a sunflower and a daisy, you might think these look alike, but they look pretty different too. So they have some similar characters that put them in the same family but they're in different uh, species and even different genera. Okay, so on to another kind of irritating plant. Gotta love them, but they sting. Um, there's a plant called stinging nettle. Uh, it's in the family Urticaceae. Uh, the genus is Urtica. The species dioica, so Urtica dioica tells us it's the stinging nettle uh, that's used in teas. It rarely grows in Florida. It has been planted sometimes, but you don't walk around in the woods finding this stinging nettle. Well, you know, I guess they had more botanists in the north before they had them in the south, so they took stinging nettle um, for a plant that grows further north. We use stinging nettle for our lovely native Nidoscalus stimulosus. It's stimulating all right. This is in a, a different family, the Euphorbiaceae, which is the family of the poinsettia. And if you've ever had a Christmas poinsettia and 
broken some of the leaves or um, the flower, you notice a white milky sap coming out. Um, that's a characteristic that most members of that family have. So if you got close enough to this stinging nettle or tread softly, another common name for it, um, you would have some see, be able to see some milky sap, sap, but your hand would probably be hurting long before you had broken that leaf off. Um, sometimes these are the only flowers blooming in a, say, a pasture or an open, disturbed area, uh, but they can be in, in woodland, along woodland trails as well. Um, the flowers are bright white, big enough to see, maybe an inch across. Uh, the leaves can have three or five lobes. That means the big indentations you see here, these These, these are called lobes. Um, the leaves are alternate along the stem. And as I mentioned, it will sting you. And it uses stinging hairs to do that. Now, in Florida, we do have a relative of the northern stinging nettle. And it's called fireweed. Some people call this one stinging nettle, too. Uh, you can call plants anything you want with your, a common name. Uh, but, um, in this case, uh, this is one you might run into uh, in your yard or in a forest. Uh, it has opposite leaves. So at any point along the stem, you'd see two leaf stalks coming from one point. Uh, there are teeth along the margin of the leaf blade, not the big lobes we saw before on the tread softly. And it has very tiny, inconspicuous flowers close to the, the stem of the, or the twig. And the thing you can see even in this photo is those hairs. And these hairs are sort of like a hypodermic needle filled with something that hurts a lot. Um, I remember my first encounter, I was hurting for about three hours because I just brushed against one in a field. Um, so they, the hairs break off, those sharp tips pour into your skin and give you an injection. Um, they're almost like glass rods. So the hairs will hurt and then the chemical will hurt. Um, it has some similarity to venoms you'd find in spiders or other insects maybe the, the worst fire ant you ever met. And uh, as I said, they some plants will kill you. These won't, but you might wish you could just pass on before this ends. Uh, another kind of plant we encounter is the burning plants. You've probably heard of uh, dumb cane. This is Diffenbachia. It's a foliage plant, sometimes a house plant. Um, it has a flower like a jack-in-the-box. It's in the same family with jack-in-the-box. Um, it has large leaves with um, attractive white veins. There are many different um, vein patterns, and our plant breeders uh, will select different patterns uh, to be appealing to new buyers and new new. People will want the latest because the pattern varies so much from year to year with what's available in stores. Um, we call the flower a spathe and spadex. So it's like a, a pole wrapped with a, a flag wrapped around it. Um, this plant has a milky latex, and that latex contains um, an irritating chemical calcium oxalate in crystals. So these again are like little needles that if you were to bite the plant or a small child were to bite it or an animal, uh, those crystals would puncture uh, your tongue and throat and spread the chemical. It's uh, uh, There's a lot of calcium in the plant world um, and it can combine with oxalic acid so if you think of acid and being 
pricked with a crystal, you might imagine that could hurt. Um, it can uh, sort of paralyze your tongue and throat. So don't, don't eat it, not good. So now I wanna go on to some plants that you might be even more tempted to call wicked because they could cause dermatitis and itching and they're invasive in Florida. For example, Brazilian pepper. Uh, not everyone, if, in fact, fewer people are uh, sensitive to the um, chemicals in Brazilian pepper, but it is a poison ivy relative and you could easily have a problem with it. Um, this um, species Brazilian pepper has compound leaves. They can have uh, between three and 11 leaflets. So since there's an odd number, you know there will always be a single one at the tip. Um, the sap is the irritating part and you'll see it all over highways and byways and natural areas in central and south Florida and it's coming along the coast farther and farther north in Florida. Um, this plant has been used in a mix of peppercorns, the pink peppers, and some people have become ill from eating that kind of pepper mix. So take care if you're sensitive to poison ivy, you might not want to eat pink pepper. And now we get to the really bad plants. These will definitely kill you. Um, castor bean, what a lovely plant, a beautiful ornamental. Look at those red fruits, so spiky and uh, interesting looking. Um, Ricinus communis is the name of the species. Uh, you may have heard of ricin as a toxin that's been used. Um, many people enjoy it as an ornamental. Uh, it's a shrub or small tree. Um, it can get pretty tall. The leaves are interesting because they form almost a circle with these indented lobes that come together in a point. Uh, they have a very long leaf stalk that comes to that center point. And the, the fruits open and expel the seeds. They're explosively uh, spread by the plant. So if you have one, you might soon have more from five to 10 feet away. Uh, so they like to spread um, and they're invasive. You know, plants that spread easily can be in the wrong place. This has been listed by the Florida Invasive Species Council, which I'm trying to learn to say instead of FLEPC, the Florida Exotic Pest Plant Council. Uh, so this is my reminder to myself and to you that the name has changed. Category two means the plant shows aggressive growing behavior, it's spreading, but it hasn't shown the disruptive behavior that their category one plants have. And those are separate lists and you can find those on the internet. Uh, but to go on with castor bean, uh, ricin is extremely toxic. You might have heard of the spy who was killed in 1978 by uh, an injection from an umbrella. So I have offered this uh, image of the uh, killer umbrella. Uh, use it on your own risk. But um, it, ex it helps to explain that a tiny amount of this toxin, two milligrams injected, can kill a person. And we know because this person died. Um, it takes more if you eat the seeds because the seeds have things other than the pure chemical. But they're so attractive, that uh, sort of bug-like look with the little head and that textured color, rich brown, mahogany, beautiful. Makes you wanna have a few, but 
don't eat them. They will kill you. So if you would like to know more about poisonous or irritant plants, there are many references uh, on the internet. You can look to the Guide to Poisonous and Irritant Plants of Florida that was produced by the University of Florida IFAS. It's very complete. It talks about symptoms, uh, things that can affect animals as well as people. So if you have livestock or pets and you're concerned about them, that guide will help you and the veterinarian uh, decide what's a potential toxic plant in your, that the animal could have been exposed to. Uh, DPI has a circular that talks about poison ivy and its relatives and how to distinguish them. And then there are many other books about poisonous plants in Florida, in the world, uh, in the Caribbean. Uh, you can go to your library and just search for poisonous plants, injurious plants, toxic plants, and you will find a wealth of information. You can also contact DPI, but if you're worried about having had contact with something poisonous or toxic or irritating, any kind of wicked plant, you can call the uh, poison control number, 1-800-222-1222. So easy to remember, and if you need it, it's a, uh, a great resource. So that's all I had planned to say today. I am so sorry I couldn't pass out any toxic plants to the audience and see your reaction or show you my giant protective gardening gloves, but I think you get the idea. Be careful when you're outside and know what you're looking at before you touch it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Patty. Um, you were planning on doing something else for us? Yes, I, I thought if there was a burning question, I would wait, but let me just go ahead. I want to reinforce the idea that some plants are difficult for us. It's pretty as a daisy, but look out, don't go crazy. It'll really do you well if you let it get under your skin. Poison ivy, poison Touch, you'll be weeping. Poison ivy could be creeping around. Measles make you bumpy. Mumps will make you lumpy. Chicken pox will make you jump and twitch. A common cold will fool ya, and whooping cough will fool ya. But poison ivy's gonna make you itch. You're gonna need an ocean, a calamine lotion. You'll be scratching like a hound. The minute you start to mess around, poison ivy, poison ivy. If your blisters are weeping, Poison ivy has been creeping around. Late at night, while you're sleeping, poison ivy might come creeping around. <laughs> Remember that. Oh, Patty. Thank you for that. It was lovely. <laughs> okay, so we, it does appear that we have some burning questions from the gallery. Um, let me scroll. Yes, that was awesome. We have lots of, you're the grandma that I always wanted. <laughs> Thank you. This is Darren. I'm sure you're the grandchild I always wanted. <laughs> I mean, you know, you can be my grandma too. Just saying. Um, 
I guess a lot of love for the song. Uh, okay. So a good question. Uh, Scott Ward is on. Hi, Scott. Scott says, hi, Patty. You've done a lot of work with palms. Are there any instances of poisonous species in this family? No, palms are our friends. They might have uh, spines and thorns and very tough leaves, but they depend more on physical properties for protection, not so much chemical properties. So there are a few fruits um, that have some toxin um, or an, an irritation for your skin. Uh, they're very spiny and the, the name, the species is, is escaping me, but it's called the sugar palm and it's only tropical. So none in Florida. Um, we have another question from Jeanette who asks, are all of these plants throughout Florida? So do you have range for all these plants? Um, no, poison ivy is throughout Florida. Several of the plants are uh, in South Florida, um, the poison wood, um, poison sumac is more in Northern Florida. Um, I'm not sure I can go through all the plants we talked about for example, the Diffenbachia is a house plant here, so it might grow outside in South Florida, but you wouldn't expect it further than that, but it could cause a problem inside the house. Um, but you can search for distribution on the internet and uh, any of them that you are more curious about, uh, you can contact me or, or some other resource. The local county extension office can help. Okay, I pulled up some um, range maps for a few of them. Would you like me to show them on the screen? Sure. To see? Okay, you Great. won't be able to see it, Patty, just everybody. Um, so this is Ricinus communis, the castor bean. It's pretty much throughout Florida, although maybe more common in central and south. And, and keep in mind when we're looking at the USF atlas, not, you know, this is just vouchered specimens and vouchering, you know, takes a little bit of effort. So it might, it is most likely present, present in other counties even if it's the other thing that. about ricin, uh, ricinus ca castor bean, it's often planted in people's yards as an ornamental, so it wouldn't be included on the distribution map necessarily, even though it could grow in the county where it's planted. Right, that's another thing about looking at the atlas as well. So if you're looking for full distribution, even in cultivated specimens, you look at iNaturalist. Um, and here is Tread Softly, or Finger Rot, very dramatic name statewide. Um, that was the one with the white flowers. And then here is Urtica chemidreoides. Do you know how to say that? Yeah, that's right. Chemidreoides. Okay, that's the heart leaf nettle. So there's the distribution map for that. And then Urtica di. Do you say dioica? Mm -hmm. Okay. And this one only has it uh, listed for uh, Alachua County. And then poisonwood tree. Metopium toxiferum, very exciting, South Florida. And then, thank God. <laughs> and then here's a uh, Urtica urens. Okay, so let's see everyone else's questions. We have a question about poisonous mushrooms, Patty, but I don't think that's your wheelhouse. No, I, I, I had to draw the line somewhere. No fungi. Yeah, I mean, I but love fun fungi, but you just can't be an expert on everything. I'm happy to eat them. I can't identify them. Mm -hmm. um, many, you know, for the question asker, who is, let's see. I can't read the question asker. Um, says, you know, one thing you could do is you have a lot of cool people in your local Native Plant Society chapter. So if you join the Native Plant Society and meet cool people, they might be able to talk to you more about your locally abundant, poisonous, and edible mushrooms. Okay. Uh, we have a request, Patty, for the next time. We have scrolling lyrics so that people can sing along. <laughs> Sounds great to me. I don't know how to do that yet with my little streaming thing, but um, yeah, I, I don't can know learn. I can learn how to do it. <laughs> um, Okay. We could at least put the page a page of uh, lyrics up so you could sing along. Yes, we can at least we can at least provide that. 
Okay, and I do have, um, oh, we have a question from Darren. What is your favorite toxic plant and why? Oh my goodness. Um, well, you know, chocolate is my favorite toxic plant. And I know it's toxic because I break out in, in fat after <laughs> I eat a lot of it. So I'd have to say chocolate. Oh, thanks. Yes. Uh, let's see. Sorry, I'm getting a new monitor, everybody. So next week, the Lunch and Learns are going to be super crisp. They're going to be in 1440p. Uh, and I have an old monitor over here that I have your questions on, and I have to squint to read it. Um, oh, Marion asks, what about sago palms? Is that only a problem for pets? Uh, don't eat them. Uh, cycads, or sago palms are one of the cycads, and zamia, the native kuti, they have um, neurotoxins I'm not sure they're throughout the plant, but certainly like Zamia roots, the rhizome, the underground part uh, has a concentration. And I think cycad, um, cycads do as well. Um, I'm not sure if it's in the leaves or seeds in addition. I would have to look that up. But they're of no danger, you know, if you just touch them. Uh, not dermatitis. Dermatitis, yeah. Don't eat them. Don't eat them. Um, Okay, we have a question to put those references in the chat box. So I don't have your presentation open, Patty. Um, maybe, could you put the slide up back up for me and I can get those references and put them in the chat box? Did that work? Yes. Okay. Can you see? Can you see that? Yes. So there is the, the that UFDC link, guys, is the guide to the poisonous and the irritant plants of Florida. And then Oh, your botany circular is a little harder to find, Patty. Number 31. Okay. Okay, and there is the second one. That is the poison ivy and its relatives in Florida. Um, let's see. Okay, and Darren asks about how to how to get involved in the Florida Plant Society. So if you're north of USF, you're probably probably in the Hillsboro chapter, which is the Sun Coast chapter, and uh, you can join online and start getting involved in chapter activities. Please give me an email, communications at fnps.org, and um, uh, once you're a member, I will direct you to uh, the leaders in that chapter, and you can start you know helping out. So. Oh, I didn't see the burning Virginia creeper. Thank you, Melanie. Melanie says, Robin asked about the burning Virginia creeper. Let me see if I can find her thing. Oh, Robin says, my neighbor said that burning Virginia creeper will have the same effect as burning poison ivy and put you in the hospital. Is this true? I don't know of any toxic properties of Virginia creeper. Uh, I, I wouldn't want to necessarily contradict your neighbor, but I would say um, it's news to me, but you might um, call your county extension office, ask a master gardener or, um, well, I can look. Got it to the rescue. Yeah, just ask me and I'll, I'll look. This is my uh, copy of the Guide to Irritant Plants of Florida. I'm always using this. Uh, it, it says the berries are uh, suspected of causing uh, 
diarrhea, dilated pupils, sweating, and weak pulse, vomiting and diarrhea. But the if consumed. Leaves, the berries and leaves, yes. I think you have to eat them. So nothing about burning them. Perhaps it was a case of plant misidentification. Yeah. I mean, if you, uh, if you just have the vines, if you're, you know, if you hack them down, you might confuse Virginia creeper and poison ivy. Or they could be growing mixed. We often see people um, uh, concerned about a plant and it's growing with another plant, so it makes identification difficult. Yes, Melanie chimes in. She says, I think that poison ivy grows along with Virginia creeper. That's what happened to me. Yeah, lots of kudos on the talk. Thank you for the talk, all of that. I don't know if that said it's excellent. Um, I think that's it for questions. Did I miss anybody's question? I'm sorry about this this monitor. I'm gonna, you see, we're gonna have a, have a really nice presentation next week with a really crisp monitor. <laughs> um, well, oh, I wanted to chime in with a comment from Kate, Kate Hurlbert is emailing me because she doesn't like YouTube. Um, she's uh, out of the Ixia chapter in Jacksonville. She says, my best friend and I cut branches to make blanket racks for horses. Um, made us both miss a week of school. She couldn't open her eyes the next morning. And when she woke up, they were swollen shut. And it turns out the branches we cut were poison oak. Oh, poor Kate. Well, I'm very sorry to hear that. Me too. I mean, it was a long time ago. To identify the plant. <laughs> well, she's a part of the, she's a leader in the Florida Native Plant Society. So hopefully her plant identification skills are high quality now. Good. But thank you all very much for uh, your attention. And I hope that you will have a good time out with the native plants. Just be careful where you step, what you brush against. And if you don't know it, don't eat it. That's right. Thank you for your presentation, Patty. And uh, again, I hope everyone has a great weekend. And if you're new to Florida Native Plant Society, feel free to email me and uh, start getting involved in your local chapter. And for everybody who's already a member, thank you so much. You make our work of uh, protecting, conserving, preserving, and restoring the native plants and native plant communities of Florida possible. All right, have a great weekend, everybody.